Good afternoon, everybody. It is March 13th, 2013. Lucky 13. My name's Dan Bull. I'm coming from you, to you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming at you. I'm, um, from my office in Los Angeles, California, here at 65 Amps. And uh, we're getting started a little late because we were having a technical chat. And we've got about 50 odd guys on here that logged in and registered. And um, I first off want to apologize uh, that I don't have my live rig working still. It's embarrassing. I do apologize. I'm sorry about it. And I'm really glad that you guys showed up anyway, because we're going to try to have an interesting conversation no matter what. Um, I, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. Last week, we kind of went into a lot of different subjects. And then a lot of these guys and I went into some very interesting conversations on Facebook this week. And of course, we're here discussing the merits and possibilities of a bedroom amplifier, which uh, we're doing, uh, oh, there's somebody outside. But um, so we're going to go through all that stuff. And uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted by all this noise out here. I apologize. So um, what's going on at 65? Well, we're finally getting our tolexing under control. And cabinets are being tolaxed very nicely. Uh, we've got a pile of Ventura heads that are done. They're working on little Elvis heads. Hang on one second. One second. What's going on? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm doing a broadcast show. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. So, um, Anyway, um, and we're, we're, everyone seems to be very interested in figuring out how to play ultra quietly, which is sort of a puzzle uh, because, uh, yeah, this Palmer speaker emulator works great. Um, but a lot of guys seem to want to have a big flame throwing tube amp and play it in their bedroom so that the kids don't wake up. And that's not really possible. Um, um, it is what it is, you know. A profane Airplane says, take the money you'd spend on a bedroom amp and bribe your neighbors. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different opinions on this, but we'll get to it. So anyway, we're making cabinets. They're looking really good. Um, let's keep it nice here, guys, on the chat window. For those of you guys watching the recording, there's a chat window going here, and we've got quite a few guys on, some of whom are hilarious. Um, and, you know, sometimes we say things that might be dirty. So if you're offended by those things, I apologize. Um, so uh, anyway, one of the things we were talking about last week that we didn't really get to finish was this concept of a tiny amp. Um, and I'm going to float my humble opinion, take it with a grain of salt, that what we're hoping for from a tiny amp is physically impossible. Um, Tubes use a lot of electricity and they generate a lot of noise. Um, there's no way to do that at a level where you feel like you're playing a big amp in your bedroom. Um, it just doesn't work. Uh, a lot of people have mentioned the Palmer speaker emulator, which I've seen. Uh, it works pretty good. It's not great. It works pretty good. Um, Yes, and people are saying, let's put this subject to bed. Um, hey, Stratocaster Mojo, how are you, man? Um, so that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm going to just kind of put it to rest. Uh, if you're looking for a tiny bedroom amp that sounds like a 65 or sounds like a Marshall or an AC30 or a Deluxe Reverb or whatever, 
two things, one of which I won't be your guy. I'm sorry. And um, second, I don't think it's possible. Uh, not with a tube amp, at least. I think the digital stuff is getting so good that it might be... Uh... Well, Nick67, I... I'm sorry, your internet's not happy. Um... But uh, anyway, yeah, well, let's put the bedroom amp thing to bed. I'm sorry, guys. I, I you know, Being as diplomatic as I can be, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's possible, and people have been trying that since the 50s. Smart people. People much smarter than me. Um, you know, the Axe Effects thing sounds great. I mean, it's $2,300. Um, it sounds really good at low volume. It does not have the feel of a guitar amp, but it sounds good. I played Kempers, too. They sound pretty good. Um, again, they don't have the feel. Um, you, you're, what you hear sounds like it's a recording of a guitar because that's what it is. And depending on who did the recording on the Kemper, it can sound good or it can not sound good. But um, it works pretty well. Hi, Knut. We haven't been live very long. We're just kind of here uh, shooting the breeze about bedroom amps again. So uh, take care, Nick, and um, hopefully you can see the recording. I'm sorry. So um, back to production. We're uh, no, I'm not going to make a speaker emulator. You guys, stop it. Here's what I'm going to tell you. If you were my friend and you were asking me these questions, I would say man up. Man up. Just play the fucking guitar. <laughs> and when people complain, apologize. Yeah, I'm sorry. And keep doing it. Um, no. UK guys, before you go, we got a new dealer in Britain. Um, Peach Guitars in Essex just signed on, just gave us a really nice order. And um, so I know you, there's two English guys on here having video problems or something. So before you go, gentlemen, uh, I think one or both of you were guys that were concerned that there weren't enough supply of England amps. Now there will be. Uh, John Priest is the guy there. Doug Gilliam, if you have tinnitus, I would seriously recommend getting in-ears. You don't have to turn them up loud to hear them. It's a good thing. I had a bout with tinnitus 20-odd years ago. and I had to quit playing electric guitar for like two or three years. Um, but in-ears are amazing for that. Now my ears are fine. I don't know what the deal was, but... Kid Gloves 2112. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that you have tinnitus. Um, my ears used to just ring. I had this howling in my ears. That sucked. Um, do the Pete Townsend thing, man. He only played acoustic guitar for a long time when his tinnitus kicked up really bad. Yeah, Kid Gloves 2112. I have that little Brian map. It sounds great. You get vertigo with headphones. Can you use like an in-ear monitor? I use the ringing in my ears to tune my guitar. Yeah, I've got a noise gate on because there's some machine out here that's making a ton of noise and it's flipping out my board for some reason. have a buzz fighting ringing very precise <laughs> yeah I have the little Vox Brian May that has the DC distortion box in it um, no we started late today Fonzarelli we're still just kind of shooting the breeze and unfortunately I don't have my live rig 
I'm gonna make myself a little more comfortable here if you guys don't mind. Very tired and worn out today. Um, welcome Fonzarelli. Uh, Mr. Fonzarelli, uh, I believe you are in England, correct? We now have a new dealer in Great Britain, Peach Guitars in Essex. Uh, they're a really nice, really nice uh, boutique shop. And they carry high-end gear, and the guys that all work there know the gear and um, can give you great information. So John Priest is the guy you want to call. I just put it on the website this morning, um, so go have a look. It's got the link to their website, all their information, their address, blah, 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 blah. And John's a really nice guy. I met him at NAMM. He sells a couple of other boutique brands and does really well and just picked us up. So there you go, Englishmen and Scotchmen, Scotsmen and Welshmen and even Irishmen. You know Peach. Okay, cool. Do you like those guys? They came across really good to me. I was very impressed with them. So... Anyway, uh, I'm going to, again, let's put this bedroom amp mess to bed. The diplomatic answer as the 65 guy is that what you're looking for is sort of physically impossible to get the big, huge sound of a tube amp down around 70 decibels or something, 70, 80 decibels. Um, it's not going to work. Not going to work at all. So, um, I don't think that's going to happen. As Dan Boole, who's just a guitar player, I would say, you play electric guitar, man. Just play guitar. Um, Les Fenderson says, do you really have any bedroom artists as endorsers? Then Deep Six It. Yeah, it's just something people keep bringing up endlessly. Um, uh, McSex Stooges 5 says, What is happening to the cabinet lines now that you're making them a house? They'll be the same, roughly. Um, they'll have the same options. Same speaker compliments. The red line ones are going to be made a little bit better. Um than they were before. Uh, the other ones weren't bad at all. We're just making the joinery consistent across all the platforms. Um, John Doe says, uh, are you planning on doing your own face plates also in the future? Yes. Uh, right now we're not, but we we're going to get a machine and do that. Um, we're still going on about bedroom amps here. Unbelievable. Um, tube amps don't work that quiet, guys. That's just it. Sorry. Um, it's the nature of vacuum tubes or valves for you Europeans. Doesn't work. Uh, but yeah, we want to get a machine where we can do our plates exactly, you know, like these. We, these are laser engraved. Um, and uh, it makes the letters look really crisp and you know everything comes across very nicely. Um, Dan, Stratocaster Mo, sonic differences between a combo versus a 112 head and cab. It's not a whole lot. Um, the head and cab is gonna have a little more bottom end because the speaker cabinet doesn't have a chassis in there taking up airspace. So there's a little more airspace in there. Uh, I always recommend a head and cab over a combo, even though um, even though it's more convenient to carry one box, um, the combo's really hard on the chassis, uh, which is why you see like old twin reverbs falling apart and AC30s falling apart because they just get the daylights beat out of them the whole time you're playing. Um, 
So are you planning on implementing the compressor? I'm not sure yet. We're thinking about it. Um, oh, excuse me. Oh my gosh. I'm really tired today. I apologize. Um, Van City Dave. You streams in and out for me today. I'm sorry. I will have a good show and Thanks for trying. I appreciate it. I don't know what's going on with Ustream today. I know everything's fine on my end. I can see the broadcast screen up here too, and it's smooth and fine. It's the phone. Are you having trouble with the video or the audio? The video garbles. Yeah, the noise gate I have is just on this microphone. I don't know what's going on with the audio. Maybe I'll just hold the microphone up to my mouth like I'm on the news or something. I barely have the gate on now. That's kind of crazy. I'll turn it off. We'll see what happens. Uh, just as I got comfortable. Now the gate's off. If you implement the compressor, will you take a bypass compressor knob into consideration, or would that have the influence on the rest of the design? Uh, way too early to say. I don't know. Um, yeah, I used to use a little choir mic, um, but it just didn't sound very good. A Spenderson says, dumb questions. Any problems of running a head and a combo together as long as the combo preamp and power are disconnected in the separate head? No, that's fine. Speaker's a speaker. I mean, like, use the speaker out of one of your combos, but run it with a separate head, disconnect the internal amp, and connect an external amp. How soon will the PCB amps be available? I'm not sure. Now we're shooting by the end of the year, I hope. Yeah, Les, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Um, someone says LTBW038 says, I say doing a licensing deal with Strymon for the reverb and the delay. Yeah, we thought about that, and I actually brought it up with those guys. The, the one thing that I hesitate to do about putting effects inside an amp um, is that you're kind of married to that effect. So if I license out the Blue Sky Reverb, and then a year from now they come out with a way better version, um... You might regret having spent the extra money having that effect in the amp because I got to charge you a lot more for it. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, so I would recommend just buying the Blue Sky Reverb. And then if a better one comes out later, then you can unplug it. I mean, it'd be nice to have everything in one box, but... It just doesn't come across, it doesn't come, ultimately doesn't work out that easy. Um, we do make, hey Tony, we do make a 412 cabinet that is a clone of my basket weave cabinet. We don't have it up on the list right now because we've just got so much other stuff we build. Um, yeah, reverb is one of those things. Uh, I've done my best to figure out how many guys really want reverb, and it's not very many. Um, I've kind of done some scientific polling around, and I know from my own experience that pros don't use reverb at all. You know, there's a few exceptions. Vince Gill on stage because he's playing mellow country music. But, um, um, and also that a reverb pedal, the way they make them now, is way better than anything I can make with a tube and a spring. Trust me. 
I mean, I have a tank reverb from 1964, Fender Blackface tank reverb, the Holy Grail reverb. It doesn't sound as good as half the pedals that are out right now. So, um, I mean, I get it. I hear guys play with reverb and it sounds good. Oh, excuse me. I apologize. I can't stop yawning today. I don't know what's going on. Um, so, um, there's that. Uh, Sean Lehman says, hi, Dan, do you have to bias 65s? Most of our amps are cathode biased, so you do not. Uh, as long as you get a matched pair of tubes, reasonably matched, you know, within 10%. <clears throat> you should be able to just pop them right in and the circuit will auto bias. The way the cathode bias works is it kind of the tubes balance themselves, you know. If one's lower, it sends more signal over it, you know, it's it's an auto balancing kind of circuit. So, one of the things someone brought up right when we were getting started uh is could I just quickly explain what push pull means? Um push pull is two amps, I mean two amps is two or four or six or eight tubes working in tandem together. Um, where a single-ended amp is just one tube going, ah! Uh, the way push-pull works, um, yeah, the bedroom amp talk put me to sleep. Get that? Get it? Bedroom? Sleep? Get it? Um, the way push-pull works is two tubes working like this. But it happens so fast your ear can't hear the difference. So, you know, each tube has a side. And one of them's going like this, and one of them's going like that. So the net result is a big fat signal because they're filling each other in. Push pull also has uh, a lot more desirable characteristics for playing guitar. Uh, because a single ended amp will just go, ah, ah, ah. Whereas with push-pull, you kind of get, ah, uh, as they complement each other. Uh, you get a lot more sustain. You get a lot more harmonic content. You get a lot smoother rise out of the tubes. Uh, or it, it, it sounds that way. So um, in my mind, single-ended is not <clears throat> excuse me, a good choice um, for guitar amps. Um, Uh, it's popular in hi-fi, uh, but those are implemented really differently than guitar amps. Bill Studio says, what determines the switching of the voltage from tube to tube? I'm not sure what you mean by that, Bill. What do I think about using a single-ended amp as a pre? It's a very unique sound. Um... <clears throat> That is pretty subjective, I think. I've heard some single end stuff that sounds okay. It usually sounds really, really old. Um, it, it sounds thin. Uh, it can sound really aggressive and cool, but it's not robust at all. It's a very, very specific sound. <clears throat> Push-pull thing, sharing the load from tube to tube. Well, the phase inverter is what splits the signal and sends it to each tube. So if your phase inverter uh, is working correctly, there's a lot of different kinds of phase inverters. There's different ways to do that. Uh, Bill is talking about the cathode bias. Uh, just look up a cathode bias circuit. You can see there's resistors that manage it. Stratocaster Mojo says, Hey, Dan, don't know if you've discussed this on the show before, but what are your thoughts about blending tube types like an EL and a 6V like Bruce Egnator does? I don't think he... Mm, uh, yeah, well, it's the EL84 and the 6V6 have um, similar needs for the output transformer. They're, the primary resistance they want to see is pretty similar. 
the only problem I have with that is that there are certain things you do for an EL84 circuit that you don't do for a 6v6 circuit and vice versa. So you kind of lose the ability to have that. Um, it works. Uh, I think when you have one circuit, preamp circuit for both kinds of tubes, the difference between those tubes becomes less distinct. Uh, there are certain things you can do in the preamp of an EL84 tube that doesn't mean any, doesn't help with a 6v6 and vice versa. Um, Well, John, that's not 100% correct. Each tube's not pushing half the sine wave. There are two different sine waves that overlap. So while one sine wave is on the positive side, you know, and there's nothing underneath it, the other one is underneath, so it fills it in. So there's actually two things going on there. But I know what you're getting at. Have you discussed the difference between class A and class AB, et cetera? Does that have anything to do with single-ended? Well, AB can only work with two tubes, so any single-ended amp is class A. And um, hi, Mickey Kid from a cold U uh, UK. You might have missed it earlier. Hi, Steve. Um, you might have missed it earlier. Uh, we got a new dealer in Britain. I put it on the website, Peach Guitars in Essex. John Priest is the guy. Very nice guy, very knowledgeable guy, knows what he's talking about, and he's a connoisseur of high-end gear. Not just some kid with a ring through his nose going, hey, bro, what do you want to buy? Um, he's good. Do I have a cold? Yeah, I, I got a cold or allergies. That's just part of the reason I'm tired. Braintree, Essex. I don't know who named that place Braintree, but yes, he's in Braintree, Essex. You are very correct, sir. Um, you know, the, the discussion about Class A and Class AB, I kind of need to have my whiteboard back so I can draw stuff on there, but um, AB is, you know, even numbers of tubes working together. Uh, just because you cathode bias something doesn't mean that it's Class A. AC30s are not Class A. They're class AB1, um, which is uh, cathode bias version of class AB. That's one of those things people say all the time. Have you revised your solids? I haven't made a solid stand. You guys are funny, funny, funny. Um, no, I haven't been trying to just keep my head above water and, um, trying to get that going. So anyway, back to the push pull thing. Was that clear? I think it was, I can't remember who did it now. It was somebody with a blue thing. Oh, I haven't, I haven't seen the lab series yet. What is it called that Miles does? Blueprinting. Yes, blueprinting. Was that you, Bill? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, let me go on the web here, and maybe I can give you a link that describes exactly what I'm talking about here. Hold on a second. I can just give you a big lecture, but I just find someone that has a good description here. There's 20 different ways to say this, right? Uh, here's an article in Guitar Player. Let's see if they got it. Right. Yeah, this is okay. There's some people that call cathode bias stuff class A, but it's not really. It's not the definition of cat. Of...
to work. And like I say, it's one of those things where people are... Check that out. Um, load var, you can't get picture? I'm sorry. Can you make a blueprinting and knob that adjust? No. <laughs> what would be cool is if you described and explained the signal path from the string vibration to the speaker output and explained the amp's participation in producing the sound in depth. Well, I could write a whole book on that. Um, uh, okay, I'll give it a quick one. The noise gate is off still. I turned it off. I have a little bit of compression on. Here, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to be roving reporter today. So let's do it like this. Um, you can hear my big deep voice. How's that sound? Is that better? Might just be Ustream doing that. So, okay, let me turn the mic down a little bit because I'm going to destroy you guys with it. Hold on. Let's just do it like that. I'll be, I'll be, uh, check one, two, check, to check, check, check. Okay. Uh, limiter's on. Okay, so I'll just do it this way. Ustream is dookie. Yeah, this is a Neumann mic. So the proximity effect is pretty heavy. Let me pull some bottom end out of this and try to make it sound right. How about that? Check one, two. Is that a little better? Sound a little more normal? Baby elephant walk. Yeah, that's a little thin now. Okay, let's get my voice to sound really good, okay? This week at Pomona Fairplex, Monster Trucks. Okay, how about that? Is that better? More baby elephant walk, Mancini rules. Uh, let's see, what other Mancini can we do? Uh... Oh, hey, Justin. Yeah, you know, the Aiken Amps has a really good description of all this stuff. So, really quick, yeah, Moon River. I was thinking of. Maybe clear the throat before starting a sentence of pilot trick. <clears throat> yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you'll notice out your left window is the Grand Canyon. Uh, we're going to fly in about 32,000 feet, Delta 9, Charlie. Uh, okay. Cleared for approach. So, here I am, roving reporter Dan Bull. So, um, how does an amp work from start to finish, from string vibration? So, you have a metal string that is stretched to tension in the air. And uh, beneath that, you have a magnet with coils wrapped, copper coils wrapped around it. That creates a flux, a magnetic field. The strings are hovering in that magnetic field. When you vibrate the string, it interrupts that magnetic field, and that creates a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of signal. Uh, the magnet, you know, has the ability to push a little bit out. Um, so, that that little magnet with copper coils is called a pickup. Um, that pickup has wires. Um, I have an Italian CNC writer. Yeah, I don't know about guitars. There's good guitars out there already. Um, you plug an instrument cable into the leads that are connected to that pickup. That instrument cable leads you to the input jack of your amp. That input jack of your amp is connected directly to the control grid 
of your first tube. And if you don't know what a control grid is, it's a screen mesh. It looks just like the screen on your window. It's, you know, it's, it's wires wrapped around poles. So, um, so um, that control grid is in a vacuum in a tube that is charged. When you excite that control grid, it creates a disturbance in that vacuum, which creates more signal. The positive side of that tube, called the plate, or the anode, everyone just calls it the plate, is charged with voltage. That's your B plus voltage. Uh, B plus on the preamp is pretty low, 200, 225 volts. That signal then goes to the next control grid on the next tube or the next control grid on the other side of that 12x7, which has two triodes in it. That control grid is now receiving a large signal. What we're doing, this is the great part, what we're doing is amplifying, get it? Amplifying uh, that little tiny disturbance in that magnetic field that you created by vibrating the metal string over it. So we're taking that little tiny signal, we're sending it through a series of circuits that will amplify it and make it bigger. Because when it, when it starts, it's tiny, 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 tiny. Uh, yeah, we're still in the preamp. We haven't got to the power amp yet. So depending on the amp you have and how you turn the knobs, I'm not going to go into great detail. This is just the overview. Uh, with voltage amplifiers, that's right. Until you hit a cathode follower and then it turns into current. But that's another conversation. Um, we're taking this little tiny, tiny signal that you created by disturbing the magnetic flux over your pickups, running it through a cable, into a control grid on a vacuum tube, into an, another control grid, usually two, sometimes it's one, uh, sometimes it's seven. And as you turn, make that thing bigger and bigger, you have the ability to put in more signal than the tube can handle. And so the tube tries to do what you're asking it to do, but if it can't, it just distorts. Um, sort of like when you start yelling at a certain point, your vocal cords will start going ah, 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 and get shredding. Control grids will do the same thing. Um, so depending on the, each one of those little series where the control grid is amplifying a signal is called a gain stage. So when you hear amp designers talk about gain stages, that's what it is. That's just one stage of gain. That is a gain stage. So for example, like our London, our original London, has a single gain stage on each side. That's it. One gain stage. Uh, and then it heads to a phase inverter. That's it. Whereas you get into, most of our amps have two gain stages. Um, the third channel on the Empire has three. Um, but most of ours are just dual gain stage amps. Because the more gain stages you create, there's, there's a downside to it. And you just got to find the balance point to where you want it. The downside is that you lose a little bit of fidelity each time you do that. Um, the more you run it through more resistors and each one of these tubes has, you know, resistors and caps all around it doing certain things, which we can go into later or on another show. But every time you hit a gain stage with a signal, you lose some fidelity and then you might add distortion. Now, for some people, that's really cool because they want to have a lot of distortion. So if you're buying a really big heavy metal kind of amp like a Bogner or, or even an Eggnator, you know, on the lower end of the economy. Um, those amps have a lot of gain stages in them. And that's how you get that big, fat, metal-y distortion. Um, it's not what we do. Uh, you know, some of our amps get really dirty, but it's not like that. Anyway, so you, you amplify the signal down the chain. Um, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You get it to where you want it. You get it where the shape is how you want it. You know, you have, go through a tone stack, which moves frequencies around. That's all it does. 
And all a tone stack does is limit frequencies. All those frequencies are there. Like a bass knob doesn't create bass. It just allows bass. So it's like if you have a treble mid bass tone stack, what you're doing is those are three gates. You're saying with this knob, I'm going to allow that much treble in. With that knob, I'm going to allow this much mid range. And with this knob, I'm going to allow that much bass. So you set that where you want it. So you've created a sine wave that sounds good to your ears. Now you have to distribute that to your power section. And there's a section called a phase inverter, which is usually also a dual triode, like a 12AX7. What that's going to do is take this sine wave, it's going to split it into two, and then it's going to take one of it and flip it over. And kind of a little bit of an explanation on how that works, just take my word for it today. But it flips it over, then you've got each sine wave that you've created, one is like this and one is like this so that you get this full signal and you know they're they're both going like this right so when you got one upside down what you get is solid signal all the way across positive side negative side just looks like one solid signal and um, positive and negative that's right John Doe so um, I'm gonna keep my mic right here so we don't have to deal with the noise gate issue anymore can you hear me okay? Is this too loud or too quiet? Or how's this? Does it sound okay? I got a little bit of a cold, so it's nasally, but um, perfect. Okay, cool. So you're going to, thank you, Bill. Oh, this is fun. I mean, this is what I love. Um, so that phase inverter, depending on what style of it is, it's going to distribute that signal to each of your power tubes. One's positive. One's out of phase, negative. They go like this, do, 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 do. but it does it so fast that if I could move my hands fast enough like this, all you would see is this, right? So this is electricity. It moves way faster than the human ears can uh, decipher. Speed of light, thank you. Took the words right out of my mouth, John Doe. Electricity moves at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. Um, which is faster than our puny little brains. Uh, yeah, 186,282. Thank you, Bill. Um, it's faster than our brains can tell the difference. But in reality, what's going on? One tube gives you this, the other tube gives you that. Boom, boom, boom. It gets so fast that all you see is this. Right? Um, so when you get a power tube that's out, then you kind of get this. Or maybe this, and that's hum when you have tubes that aren't matched right. Um, so then the so the the power tubes are just bigger versions of the preamp tubes. Only instead of having just a control grid in there, they have two more grids to manage because now the signal is big and the B plus voltage, remember the B plus we talked about, right? That's on the positive side of the tube on the anode. Depending on your amp, the B plus voltage now is anywhere, normal range of modern guitar amps is 300 to 500 volts. So it's more than double, sometimes more than double, um, what was going on in the preamp tube. So they get hot um, and they do uh, different things. So you're Zer and Terrasant. I was get excited, it, Bill. He's in Deutsche. Um, so you have to do other things inside of these tubes to make them be able to operate at full efficiency. So there's two more grids in that tube. So you have the control grid, which is kind of obvious what it is. It, the controlling signal comes in there. It's like the throttle. You know, your volume knob is connected to the control grid. That's what that is. Um, it's, uh, it's controlling the signal, right? But on a pentode power tube, pentode 5, you know, from the Latin penta, uh, a pentode has... Um, a screen grid and a suppressor grid. And the screen grid is a way to up the charge in the tube, create more attraction from the negative side to the positive side. 
So you can put some static voltage on that screen grid. <clears throat> it still swings a little bit, but not nearly as much. And you can sort of supercharge that tube. Now what happens is there's so many electrons flying through that tube that sometimes the plate can't absorb them all and they bounce back. And the, the plate gets saturated. And that bounce back, which I think a lot of engineers call blowback, um, the blowback can hit the control grid and make noise. So they put another grid in there called a suppressor grid. And all that does is suppress the blowback. So what you get is more clean output by doing that, because that blowback can make distortion. So if you put the suppressor grid in there, you get more clean output. It's getting rid of the noise. Sort of like when you're, you know, you, you're working on a photo on your computer and you can denoise the photo, take out all the little specks. You know, that's what a suppressor grid does to the sound. And now we're almost to the end. Are you ready? Bill, are you still there? So um, the pa now this little tiny signal we, we initiated by vibrating a string over a magnet, right? We've taken it through, do, 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 we made it, taken it from being this big to being this big, right? Big signal. The output tubes on the positive side of the output tubes on the plates where it has the most voltage in the amp. That's where you know, people say, what's your B plus, man? My B plus is 475. God damn it. You know, you got a lot of voltage. That's my John Wayne amp builder impression there. So um, that 475 volts that's coming off. Uh, now all, all, all pentodes have a suppressor grid. Um, ooh, excuse me. So um, the B plus on the positive side of the tubes um, go to an output transformer. It goes to the primary, which is the first part of the output transformer, the primary. And it's a transformer, and the word is pretty literal. Um, it transforms the signal we've made into something that can be useful to a speaker. So that signal gets transformed from the primary. The primary is hooked up to the tubes. The other side is called the secondary because it's the second part of this chain. Uh, that's right, it gets turned into AC. And, uh, or it's turned into what DC, I always forget it backwards, whatever the speaker wants to see. Um, that's how tired and sick I am. Um, and the secondary, you can insert wires in the secondary depending on how much load that it wants to see. If it wants to see a 16 ohm load, that way it'll balance. So if you put it at the top of the transformer stack, It'll want to see 16 ohms. Uh, you're using the full wind of the transformer, and that way the speaker and the output transformer will balance. Because, you know, the speaker is a reactive load. When you hit it, it goes, whoa, whoa, right? So that output transformer has to balance that. So they have to go like this, you know? So if the output transformer expects to see a 16 ohm load and you give it an 8 ohm load, it's just going to push like that. It's going to push too hard. They won't balance. And vice versa, if you have your output transformer set on 8 ohms, and, yet, and then output transformer, and then you put a 16 ohm load on it, the 16 ohm load is going to be too much. So it's going to work too hard, and it's going to give you saturation and distortion. That sometimes is cool, sometimes it's not. Um, the overheating you really run if you underload it. If you overload it, it, it doesn't really hurt the transformer. It just doesn't work very well. You know, it's sort of like, you know, here I, I've got a boat that can hold a thousand pounds and I put 2000 pounds on it. Why doesn't my boat go through the water very well? Well, because it's overloaded. You know, I've got a pickup truck with one ton capacity and I put two tons in it. Why is the truck riding like this, you know? 
the same kind of thing. It's good to have them balanced. It's good. Uh... So anyway, Bill, that was like a 15-minute explanation of... Uh, hi, Pink Paisley. Oh, this is the very, very simple version. Uh, yeah, now you can be an ant maker. Uh, no problem. Just have suicidal tendencies. Like masochistic tendencies. And you can be an ant maker. I know it's a free show. But it would be cool if you could make a summary or table of contents of listing on the major topics discussed in each show. Yeah, it would be great. I just don't have a lot of time. Um, Justin Magana says, remember that the tubes will see a higher impedance on the primary side if the secondary load, right. And that higher impedance on the tubes creates the same effect. Uh, the German explanation now. Uh, in German? Amplifiers sind sehr interessant. 65 amps macht viel Spaß. Du sollst ein 65 kaufen heute. How about that? Uh, now nah, we'll have going into phase inverters is getting uh Verstärker, that's right, I forgot. Yeah, Verstärker. Uh, Bill Studio, is having the Schule gelernt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, will I be at Got One? Oh, you got one already. All right, thank you, Pink Paisley. Uh, what is the purpose of an ohm switch on the back of an amp if it amp is designed to run at 16 ohms? It's a good question, Benjamin Harrison. Harrison Harris Benjamin. Um... It's, uh, there's a couple reasons for doing that. One of which is you may want to change the speaker in your amp, so that's fine. Also, if you want to add an extension speaker, if you have two 16-ohm speakers in parallel, your load becomes 8 ohms. It gives you the ability to add an extension speaker or, um, or change the speaker. What happens internally when you using the ohm switch? Remember I told you on the secondary of the output transformer, you can put wires in at different positions so that it expects a certain load. You're just switching between those wires. Yeah. Alles klar. Will I be at Frankfurt Music Mesa? No, I'm sorry. Not going to be there this year. We got too much stuff going on. I always wondered why there was no multi-capacitor varitone in an amp. There is on the London. Buy a London or a Soho or a Monterey or a Stone Pony. That's what that is. Oh. Yeah. We got it. Uh, I thought I was going to Frankfurt this year, but I won't be. How does a multi-capacitor work? Uh, the capacitor just sets a bandwidth of frequency that'll pass through it. Um, so bigger capacity allows more bottom end. That's it. Kind of puts a floor. You know, like a 0.01 will not allow as much bass as a 0.02 so on and so forth. How does a flux capacitor work? If you put garbage in the top of your DeLorean and get it to 88 miles an hour, was that right? Be okay. Can you vary this? There's no variable capacitors that work very well. Um, you just kind of got to switch through different values of capacitors. More or less J-Lo, that's right. If you like bottom end, that's really good. That's really good. What can you do with input impedance? Uh, it just drops the signal down. 
you know, like most amps have a 68K resistor off the amp just to level it and smooth it out. Um, yeah, it kind of matches the guitar. It depends on your guitar. Does it affect tone? Yeah. The more you have, the more it's... This amp right here. Let me show you. This is perfect. I have the Apollo right here. See this switch that says normal half and pad? Normal is no input resistor at all. This is a bass amp. It works really good as a guitar amp, too. Um, half is the, I can't remember exactly the value, but it was the same input value that the Ampeg B15 had. Pad is just a larger resistor, so if you got an active bass, the B15's had really low input impedance, so. It doesn't really work for modern bass. So we put another one on there. So if you're playing a powerful bass with active electronics or just a big pickup in it, um, you, you get all the benefits without making your amp just distort completely. So there you have it. There you have it. So anyway... I think we're coming to the end of our show. What are the cons to hooking up a low watt head to a high watt cab? Less efficient? Yeah, you're not going to move those speakers very much. Um, Kid Gloves 2112 says, how'd you get so smart? Uh, I'm not really that smart. I thank you for saying that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, probably because I have a cold, I can think. Um, Uh, I've been playing with amps since I was 12 years old. You just kind of learn over time. I, there's guys that know a lot more than I do. I just have my own particular take on it. Um, I have a little bit of electronics training, not that much. Um, and I read a lot. I just read a lot. And it kind of becomes, after a while, yeah, 35 years. I took my first Marshall apart when I was 12. Um, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I just, um, so, um, I did put it back together. It just took forever and I screwed it up over and 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 over again. And you learn from those experiences. Um, I ruined a lot of good amps, um, trying to do stuff. I electrocuted myself a lot, um, which explains my personality. Um, I burnt myself a lot. Uh, old callousy burns. Um, I listen to smart people. I pay attention. And uh, yeah, I've melted a screwdriver before. Um, and every time I'm around somebody who knows something about amps, I learn something new. Um, you know, everyone has a different take on it. It's sort of like cars, you know. It's, if anyone sits there and goes, this is the way it is and everything else is wrong, they're just kind of... There's 25 different ways to do this right. Maybe 2,500 different ways to do this right. It's sort of like cooking, you know. It's... Um, what's left to do in the amp world? I feel like so much has been done. What's your dream amp if money wasn't an issue? Uh, man, that's a really good question. Um, we are sort of practicing a dead art, if I'm going to be honest. Uh, there's no new tubes in the world. Tube amps in general seem to have uh... Oh cool. Hi, you streamer seven three two nine four eight. You have to refresh your browser a couple times so we can see. But you're the guy that took the pictures with Laura. Nice. Uh yeah, bedroom amp. Uh 
We're uh, two. It's, it's funny because we had this whole conversation on Facebook this week, which I kind of wanted to get into today, but we got off on this, and I've only got about five minutes before I have to run. But I, I think two amps have definitely hit their golden period, uh, sort of from the mid '60s to the mid '70s. Um, and I think what we're doing now is polishing something that's already been done. Uh, we're not inventing anything at all. Uh, two 8 watt heads, can you connect them to an 18 watt cabinet? A lot of 16 ohm cabinets have to. You got to see how that input's wired. Some inputs are connected to each other. So if, you, if they're connected to each other, one head's going to send power right back into the other one and blow up your output transformers. See how the cabinet's wired. If those two jacks are wired together, don't do it. If each one of those jacks goes to its own speaker, you can do that. But if they in any way, shape, or form overlap, you're going to blow up your amps. Um, but anyway, uh, we are practicing a dead art here. And... Um, there are a lot of people who argue um, pretty convincingly that um, there's nothing new under the sun in guitar amps. Uh, so we're, we're, we're taking an existing art form and making it better. No, I don't mean dead like it's dying. I mean dead like Latin. Like there's no new words in Latin. Right? It's still a beautiful language. But there's no, it's a dead language. Uh, people still use it. You know. We're speaking a dialect of electronics. That's what we're doing. Um, uh, so it happens to be a dialect that you and I really love. Um, so that's cool. Um, yeah, you know, the, the stuff you see for me is new to us, and but it's nothing anything's ever done. Um, well, the master voltage is an old hi-fi thing that some guy did in the 70s. Um, the, it was registered in 1971, I think. And, and the bump is really pretty simple. Um, Fletcher58 says, Dan, are Fender 2 ohm output transformers made to them? Yes, they are. Or are they actually 8 ohms? They're just not wired up. No, I mean, the transformers can do higher impedance. They just put the... They set them at 2 or 4 ohms because you don't have to wind it all the way up. It's cheaper to make a 2 or 4 ohm. Uh... The digital road has not turned up anything but disappointment. No, um... You know, the digital stuff sounds pretty good. Uh, I, I'm not offended by it at all. Um, it just doesn't act like a tube amp. It doesn't interact with your strings and the pickups the same way that it, leaning your guitar into a, leaning your guitar into a 100 watt Marshall does. Um, you're playing a recording of a guitar. That's all it is. No compromise on quality. That's new. Well, there's a lot of guys making good stuff. You know, I appreciate you saying that, Alex. Um, thank you. I just try really hard. Um, it's arguable whether it's a rational thing to do or not. Um, but I do. And it's uh, some days a lot more fun than others. Sorry, my cable's tangled here. Uh, some days it's a lot more fun than others. Um, some days... Guys that are building boutique amps feel like Vincent Van Gogh, you know, to die a poor bat death and be appreciated after they're gone. Other days, you just have a blast. You just have an absolute blast. So, um, so you know, uh, find some solace. Says if you can connect an 8-ohm head to a 16-ohm cabinet, which way would it affect the tone? It's going to break up earlier. It's going to saturate earlier. Because you got too much load on there. Um, what is a good day like in the shop? Uh, lots of money comes in. A new prototype is sounding great. Uh, 
I mean, I wrestle with that too. I mean, the only thing I really want to do is I want to go further down the road of this high current, low voltage thing. Um, as far as brand new circuits go, I don't know. I mean, it's arguable. I mean, there's, you know, everybody kind of seems to come up with a new trick uh, that doesn't stick. You know, there's the dink mount knob. Um, they people get excited about for six months, and then they kind of go. Eh. Basically, what people want out of tube amps, in my humble opinion, is really good sound. They want a platform that amplifies and illustrates what they're playing on their instrument really well. Um, that's what I go for. Harmonic richness, right? Yeah, deep, complex, rich sound, which isn't the dink donk knob, you know, or the poo poo feature. Um, yeah, some amps, the high gain amps are much more forgiving, and that's more fun when you're a kid and you're learning how to play guitar, and it covers up your mistakes. But it also doesn't show off um, doesn't show off what you can do, you know. Uh, you can't do the master voltage for two different channels. It's the same set of power tubes. Um, doesn't work. You can't drop the voltage on those power tubes and then switch channels and all of a sudden the voltage is right back up. Um, it's a lot of voltage to switch around. Plus it doesn't switch instantly. When you raise the voltage on the tubes, they need a second to balance. You can't do it. Sorry. Does that make sense? I wish you could. I mean, you could have two output sections. Christopher Bot says, uh, sometimes I miss my crate blue voodoo 120. Yeah, don't we all? So, um, uh, Martin Gooseland says, hey, I got my NOS tube from my Soho today. Sounded great. Thanks for the tip. Cool. What'd you get, Martin? Bill Studio says, think, think about putting out an in-depth article on what makes an amp work. It would be right up your alley and many would enjoy it. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, you can always link them to this show, the recording of this show, which I'll have posted on yeah, Facebook and YouTube today. So uh, I got a split. I got a call that's going to happen here in a minute, and I need to go see a man about a horse. Um Justin Magania, I love this comment. I think that the better you get at playing guitar, the less gigas you need on the front panel. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, a knob's not going to make you play any better. It's not. Uh, pedal's not going to make you play any better. And guitar is not going to make you play any better. You just had to pick up a guitar and play the damn thing. And that's hard. It takes a lot of work, and guys are always looking for shortcuts. And that's why the super gainy amps are really fun if you're starting or you don't play much because they're very forgiving. They let you get away with things that shouldn't happen. And that's cool. I get it. You know, it's like an automatic transmission. Most people rather drive with an automatic transmission. But if you want to race around a track, it's not going to work right. What was that knob quote from last week? Uh, yeah, if your amp has more than seven knobs, you're one of them. Was that it? Find Finn DeSolas. Does an amp with 8 ohm, for instance, is that a cost cut somewhere in the train? Yeah, if you don't want to have all the winding up there, you can save money by not winding all the way up the transformer. Um, I can't repeat that, McSex Stooges 5, but that's cool. Uh, thanks, Dan. Great show, very generous. Oh, thank you, guys. Gosh. I, fine. I, hi, Peter. Peter in the Netherlands. How are you, man? Um, 
Thanks again for the show. I always dig your view. Oh, thank you, Dom. That's really nice. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have a great lunch and um, got a lot of work to do this afternoon. I'm going to be heads down typing. Thank you, Les. I appreciate you going. Well, guys, I'm going to go ahead and start signing off unless there's any emergency. Um, Christopher Bott says, love my empire. I would hug you if not for you. Oh, Christopher, that's so nice, man. Thank you. I'll hug you back, brother. Well, hopefully we'll see each other sometime, somewhere. Uh, thanks, Dan. Have a great week. See you next time. Thank you, Willie. Empire rocks. Thank you, Norwegian slow-mo. Thanks, Dan. Very interesting and informative. Thank you, Blaine. Gosh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, NAM 2013. Well, we just finished NAM 2013. Maybe NAM 2014. I don't think we'll be doing summer NAM at all. Um, thank you, Fletcher 58. Kid Gloves 2112. Peace. Juice. Bitsum next in mall. Bis bald, hoffish. Uh, I hear summer NAM is lame. Later, Justin. We'll talk, man. I know you and I are, need to talk. Um, Summer NAM's a lot smaller than the regular NAM, and it's kind of not really makes sense business-wise for you to go there. John Lehman, my Ventura should be here this week from Pro Guitar Shop. Can't wait. Excellent. Bass Face Josh, thank you, buddy. Uh, love my 65. Thanks, Dan. Oh, thank you, guys. Remember the bigger horse. Bigger the horse, the more poop you have to clean up. Okay. I got you, Bill. I'll do that. Depends on how much you feed them. Uh, Troy Slab, great show as always. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it very much. Well, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. And thank you, guys. It was fun. I hope we didn't go. Um, I hope you didn't. Uh, German ordered Ventura at PGS. I don't think that guy was German. I uh, hope not. Oh, Sean Lehman. He's an American. Um... Uh, Layman, yeah, there's, there's people in the United States with German heritage. I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, synth amps next. Bedroom synth amps that are solid state that make you sound better. That'll be the topic for next week. How to sound like Hendrix without waking up the kids. Yes, I'd love to come to Holland, Peter. I hope I can do that. Um, yeah, that'll be my topic for next week. The ACDC wall of sound while your wife watches American Idol next to you. Good morning, Fruit, Nunish, Toyotas. What is all this? Is this German words you remember, Bill Studio? Yeah. 65 flutes. Yeah, okay. Solid state or tube? Exactly. All right, fellas, you guys take care and we will talk soon. Oops, wait a minute, chat window went away, I'm missing stuff. Oh, gotcha. Uh, Doug Gilliams. Talking about a book on Amazon. Yeah, there's a bunch of good tube amp books out there. I like them all. All right, fellas, take care. See you next Wednesday.